Hello and welcome to another live code hangout. We will be working on the Western Friend website during today's session and I'm going to take a uh, quick maintenance task to remove some migration scripts and code. This way our tests will pass and our test coverage will increase. So currently if I look at the test coverage we'll see there's some failures. I'm not exactly sure Interesting. I'll take a look at this. So first failure is the testing environment doesn't have a reCAPTCHA private key. So let's try to fix this first thing. So to get a little bit of forward movement here, let's open up our friend ChatGPT. Now I'm not logged in. Darn it. Let me log in real quick. Okay, good. Logged in GPT for advanced data analysis. So while running Django tests, I'm getting a failure message that the environment variable is missing or undefined. How can I set the environment variable to a temporary value during the testing? While writing this, I think I have an, a different solution. Of, I set the default to an empty string. I think this will go away. But uh, let's just see uh, what GPT says. So it looks like it's possible and common. In your test case, you can override settings. I don't want to do that through the whole <laughs> test suite. So that's a bit of an overkill because uh, this was a little bit deeper. There we go. So let's bring up the terminal here. Not sure if we're going to update. There it goes. Make sure our development database is running. And if I go to settings under a core, there's a there are a few settings here for the um, recapture. And what we're doing is uh, OS get. I think this defaults to none, so we'll default to an empty string. But before saving, I'm going to run these tests. So I get this same error locally. I should have said keep DB. And anyway, it's going to create a throwaway database. Now this is interesting. It's able to run the tests in this environment. Let's see what GPT makes of this error. The error indicates that the recapture private key environment variable is either missing or not set it as a string. There we go. So empty string could be the difference here which is required for the configuration of the capture package within your Django application. To resolve this, you should set the recapture private key environment variable to the correct value. For testing purposes, you can set it to a dummy string. And again, this would be a solution that I would need to do across all the tests. And since it's coming from an environment variable in our settings.py, could I just default to an empty string there? Would that be, you know, a sensible solution? Okay, so they are, now we're getting the failures that were from earlier. This is relating to the um, some tests. This string out of range. This could be these could be important tests that are failing. But they've only recently started failing. I'm not sure what happened. That's issue number nine twenty nine. So in the pull request, I'll say. Close. 929 so it's linked we'll wait for the ci to run code ql pipeline takes the longest i'm thinking about disabling this or at least it doesn't need to run so often i'll look into that later we do want some automated code quality support i've tried a couple of other code quality solutions and in both of those i had some difficulties so i ended up disabling them we'll wait for this to run i won't push any more changes but the next essentially the next thing is actually in the settings i need to leave the settings open right here content migration we can probably remove this to do i'm not going to do the paypal webhook support we're not synchronizing the paypal data and essentially this whole app can now be removed quite a large change okay it looks like we still have failure but now I think the failure is going to be uh, the tests for the migration yeah so that's correct so if I remove that code make sure the project still runs and push the changes while these tests are running I'll get some more tea I'll be right back
All right, so we, we do have a couple of errors and a warning. I'll have to figure out the pagination thing. Aha, so our cart tests, yeah. Oh, okay. So let me grab the settings real quick. To change the settings, I'll stage those. And I'll revert these for a moment. And then what I need to do is move the move this getter create site root page to a shared or a common place. Core test utils up high. Alright, so that fixed it there. And let's see if there's one more place. No module name content migration. Cart tests same. So it looks like the last one is here in the content migration module. So at this point I can remove the content migration module. everything succeeded I've got a couple of deprecation notices I'll or at least an, a warning and a deprecation notice I'll need to handle them separately not exactly sure how to resolve this warning but I'll go into more details about that in another stream perhaps maybe this one so tester was uh, passing and I'll just commit these changes a little bit in chunks so move get or create cyber page helper very good oh some lint and the rest of it is just remove content migration app. 86 files, number of lines of code. So right now our lines of code is delta, and plus two, minus two, so zero delta. <laughs> Let's see what it is when I push. Okay, we'll refresh the page. Minus 5,000 lines of code. A lot of tests, a lot of migration code, almost 6,000 lines. If I were to round, I would round it up. So we'll wait for this CI pipeline to run. It should be successful. It should the test should pass. They pass here locally, and less code is more. So in other words, we're removing code. So our code quality should be improved overall. Our maintainability score should go up. Uh, code coverage should go up. We're at 84 prior to this pull request. 84 percent, largely due to the amount of code that I've left uncovered in the content migration app. See, we're only at 46% coverage there. Uh, a lot of manual testing, you know, multiple imports. We've imported in staging environment a couple of times, and you know, we've launched the site. So I think it's been done enough that, um, to my knowledge, we've covered our bases. We still have some safety checks in place if we need to roll back to the Drupal site for a moment and then rerun the migrations. Or another strategy was to run a partial content migration. For example, I had overlooked a publishing date field in the libraries, uh, library items. So I just partially migrated those dates, publication dates. Uh, so at this point, I think it's okay for our project to lose this code. And as I've mentioned in a prior session, it's in our Git history, as well as on GitHub, this pull request. So if we need to, I can revert this change. I can recover these files. We just don't need to like actively maintain them. Okay, so we do have <laughs> some errors. Let me just refresh real quick. Three lines are missing coverage, all right. It's code coverage, all right. Forms models, 100%. Delta, nah, negative here. And the accounts models, okay, interestingly. Oh, uh, true. Uh, these are so thin, and I basically copied them directly from the Django abstract user. I think it was the abstract user class. Uh, I'm going to kind of trust these <laughs> these lines of code. They're copy pasta, and they're introduced in a different pull request in any case. So somehow, CodeCub is just picking picking up on them now. I won't use those as a blocker. 
However, we do have Codice static analysis in progress and CodeQL is still in progress. Hey, Dota, what's up? How are you doing? Tests. Oh, does it? Oh, no. Okay, I just tweaked the um, microphone settings. Thanks, you're always helping me for <laughs> correct my audio. Let me see. Let me just disable all the filters real quick. Here's with no filters on. How does this sound? I can isolate if it's a particular filter. I've got only three filters. Noise suppression. Ah, okay, so here's noise suppression. I've enabled noise suppression. Did that get rid of some of the white noise? Okay, one second. Let me make sure I've got the right device selected. Yes, so this is the device. I hope that wasn't too loud. So I think the upward compressor, compressor is the culprit. Here's a limiter, minus three dB limiter. It shouldn't have any effect. It just keeps your ears from popping if I sneeze or cough. So that, that should be fine. And now, okay, am I underwater now? Upward compressor, water. Hello, SpongeBob. Okay, I'll leave that off. I do want to apply a compressor. Uh, this upward compressor is new. Um, I just use the default settings. I'll use a more conventional compressor. That way the audio volume stays relatively stable. And I'll just do a slight dB boost so I'm audible. Testing one, two, three. This is how loud I talk normally. I'm in the yellow now. This should be relatively audible. I'm going to bump it up to four. Okay, am I still in the now I'm now I'm in the red a little bit. In the minus ten dB. Water now with the compressor on? Okay, turning compressor off. Compressor is off. At four for sure. Ah. Whoa. What about now? At two. So that I can stand the yellow, it looks like. Twenty was accident. <laughs> Sorry about that. Two decibels. I can I don't need a compressor at all. I just uh I want the um two is better. Alright, let's leave it here. Because the compressor makes the dynamic range smaller, so it's more conversational, continual level. The upper compressor is supposed to bring the quiet parts up a bit, and the other compressor is squashing the you know transients and louder segments. You can use both, I guess, but I don't know. Try one. Okay, I can do one. Compressor one dB. This is just to make up. Oops. Make up. <sighs> Sorry. Yeah. Uh, improving the code coverage by removing code. <laughs> removing a whole bunch of code. So we're at 84% code coverage. And I'm removing code uh, about 5,500 lines. And this code has only 46% coverage. There's a couple of lines that are flagged as being uncovered. So I suppose if you're curious about writing, interested in writing some unit tests, we could write some assertions against these, such as maybe assert called would be a good one. So my user model has two new fields in order for it to um, adhere to the API, the interface that is required by our um, registration flow. Our new registration flow sends an email verification. And so I had, had to add this email user um, method. Okay, cool. Yeah, lurk away. And then this clean method. I think I'll just defer these because actually there's a feature I need to work on. <laughs> but uh, I'm going to merge this pull request and actually work on the actual feature. I just wanted these tests to pass. So that if I write this new feature uh, and decide to write the test for it, I'll not get false failures. So here we go. So momentarily, our code coverage should change. I think after this runs, so we'll look at this. Oh, wow, 98% coverage now, right away. Uh, why did I decide on code coverage? Like this particular code cov or just in general code coverage? I think the main main reason in general, oh, why is that metric that matters? Good point. Well, in general, I want to have confidence, some, some level of certainty that the code is behaving as I would expect it and with the con within the constraints of expected boundaries or whatever behaviors. So tests I see as a way of taking a piece of code and expressing all the possible or, or expected behaviors and, and um, negative cases where you don't want it to do something as well. And then being able to replay those 
you know, on demand. Yeah, and I'm not extreme about how much code under test. I think it should be a, a significant proportion though, 80, 90%, basically, so that I, I don't accidentally break the stuff. You're all, or I'll get a notice right when I break something, the test will start failing. Even if the test is just almost, you know, redundant, it's really, sometimes the tests are just really flaky because they're really just written directly to how the code behaves in a specific context. But that's the, I guess, purpose of them. I get a little bit of a, a warning sign when I'm doing something that's affecting another part of the application. Yeah, that's cool. It does encourage me to write tests and I'm doing it as a, there's too much in my project to keep in mind and I, I can't really see when things are breaking. And I, I wanna have some confidence that things are still working when I deploy the changes that I'm adding. And I want to also understand the code better and think through the behaviors and the tests help me think through the domain a bit. Yeah, that's true. I'm not, again, using this metric as like a particular dogma or anything like that, but it's just more that I want to have at least um, the significant the critical parts of code under coverage. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. What kind of code coverage tool did you use for that? Yeah, that's kind of what I'm expecting too, is I, I know the behavior is still the same and especially with code that is used in multiple places in the app. There's interactions that are kind of sometimes complicated. Okay, so .NET one that was a um, coverage tool. Yeah, CodeCub, I use this at work and in on my open source side projects, which this, so, uh, this site just launched, by the way, this Western Friend website is now live. If you want to check it out, I'll just send you the link. You can, you can see the fruits of our labor. This was a five year project. <laughs> We launched it um, on Wednesday, Wednesday evening, Eastern European time, Europe time, Eastern Europe. Where is that one? Insights. So it was almost, we launched it almost five years <laughs> to the day. It was a little bit past. And there was a lot of this was just writing that test coverage that we were just talking about, <laughs> like a test sprint, uh, particularly in my migration scripts. But then uh, at the last moment, we decided to switch back to PayPal for our payment processor from Braintree. And so I had just a quick refactor of the payment system. And so that's what these last spikes were. But most of this was feature development. Not a lot of tests were written <laughs> up to that point, to be honest. Most of the tests were written here with the help of Copilot. And I'm curious now, if I look, I think at the code frequency, if I can see this big blob of deletions. Yeah, boom. There's all these t tests that were going on. And then, uh, boom, I just kind of removed a bunch of them just now. I think that's up to date. I like these. This is kind of cool. How big is the blog? <laughs> well, it's a, it's a different. It's not just a blog. It's actually um, an online magazine. So it has like a bookstore, an archive that goes back to 1929, all these issues. And online reader for the issues. In the first edition of Friends Bulletin, 1929. Uh, you know, this is done by Internet Archive but, Archive, but you can select the text. You can search within them. We have more recent issues. These top three are subscribers only. So we have a way of subscribing to the magazine. And all the older issues in, um, going back to the 90s when it was transitioned over to Western and Friend, they can be read online. And then the deep archive goes back to 1929, like I was just pointing out. We also have a multimedia library. So a bunch of different content that didn't quite make it into the magazine and the faceted search. Uh, we're publishing podcasts and memorial minutes for people in the community who have passed away. And there's relationships in all of our data uh, between meetings and people and authors of articles. So it's uh, online events and uh, events calendar and uh, you know regular pages a contact form I just added the capture to this contact form so it's, yeah it's like a big uh, project it took quite a while to port it over from Drupal okay okay yeah so the blog would be a much smaller scope in particular you wouldn't have to worry about you know like e-commerce and uh, subscription model and things like that necessarily unless you're building like a sub stack or something like that I suppose but for that for the blog you can just use this wagtail CMS Uh, out of the box it'll it'll be pretty much ready to roll this is what we used markdown files yeah that's a good good design keeps it simple and publish i'm i'm thinking about publishing a blog with markdown as well so i can have my own 
space. Also, like books. There's this one. Let me look this up on my phone real quick. Uh, if I can get the URL for this. Publishing thing, Quarto. Q-U-A-R-T-O. Because I would like to kind of uh, maybe start writing some larger scale books or publications using Markdown. I found this one is pretty cool using basically Jupyter Notebooks, Python or uh, Pandoc or other Markdown forms. You can just create um, websites and books with that as well. For example, like a book about programming or something might be kind of fun or a website of, about this game development project that we're kind of starting up. But, uh, all right, let's see the no code. Yeah, that's nice. And um, you just have like a, an action that runs on it to deploy it build page oh how do you do find the action here jekyll oh yeah 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 cool nice yeah the github pages default uh jekyll integration is pretty convenient very cool project graveyard boomer bot I like the zombie theme expense report kata i did look into those code katas as well i found some i haven't practiced any of them but it's a good idea i like the idea yeah cool so javascript and python I've got an idea for a Python project I'm looking for a collaborator on using uh, large language models. I might start it up in, a, in some, uh, actually today, and I'm gonna work a bit on this capture feature and then I'll take a break. And this evening I'm gonna work with Langchain on some large language model idea that I have. It'll be open source. And it's like the idea is to have, it's not my, it's not unique to me, but this idea is that, you know, a lot of times when we're prompting these generative AI, it takes like, multiple steps to get a good output you can't just get a good output the first prompt usually you have to go back and forth and refine it and uh, you end up building like a sequence you can call it a workflow or a process now on the other hand so like if i'm writing an article i'll have a process of how i interact with the um, just in generally if i wrote it i would have a process you know outline it then fill in details and find resources that help me um, fill in more details and you have a process for writing blog posts, for example, with large language models the same. So the idea is to have an open source platform that allows people to define these processes and then interact with the process via natural language. So you are guided through step by step and have multiple bots that will take the next output from the previous step and prompt you further, prompt the human for the next input. So it's a conversation, but it's done in a way, it's like an interview. The bot is kind of interviewing you to get the prompts and get the details out of you. And just expanding this one layer further, then there's this idea of business processes. And it's the same idea you have processes. Like if you're gonna do a market report, market analysis, you might need to first find a bunch of related companies and, and do some you know research on their products and profitability and things like that. And these AI can help you with those steps. But the thing is, it's not always easy for the person to string together the process. So you have an MBA, you know a lot of these business, business processes then probably. Uh, and what we're doing is just trying to codify those processes in large language model chains and um, support people in their work on these sometimes pretty complicated tasks like preparing an investor report or analyzing financial data and communicating that to um, the board of directors, those types of things. All right, what's your, let me take a quick break, but yeah, like uh, type the story and I'll check it in just a moment. I'll be right back. Okay. Right, I'm gonna get some tea and take a quick break. Just a couple minutes. All right, let's see. So building software that dealt with manufacturing of fine chemicals, and they had these recipe ingredients documents that would get passed around. You decided to follow how the document went from the plant to QA to shipping, whatever the flow was. And they would have some kind of documentation control. There was no flow. The batch record floated around the plant, seemingly at random, just like hand to hand almost. <laughs> Somebody left it on the lunch table. It's got a mustard stain on it. Yeah, so this is like, ah, okay. 
So at least there was some digitization going on, I guess. <laughs> yeah, so this is like business process automation in a way with LLMs and uh, particularly for processes that involve creativity or generativity or summarization. And it's not just like generative AI in the mix here as well. It's um, any kind of, uh, it doesn't have to be artificial intelligence, but for example, machine learning algorithms that can help summarize knowledge or reduce the dimensionality of a research data set that was uh, scraped off the web by a large language model. And then utility uh, nodes, you know, it's called, it's kind of a graph in my mind, uh, such as like a Google sheet where the stuff gets dumped. This is not my idea alone. I've been following some YouTube channels and seeing some recipes where you're integrating LLMs to help you do research, summarize that research, structure it, the CSV that goes into GitHub, then it's fed to another chain. So I'm kind of wanting to do that. Uh, just to learn how to do it and then with the perspective of how I can use it to benefit people and companies in their process make people's lives easier in a way by have, giving them a personal assistant that has well-structured business processes embedded in the mix so they don't have to always invent their own business process that's already accomplished yeah so that's the idea 300 people in the plant and you got this uh, sheet floating around. Yeah, so if you're interested in these LLMs, I'll try to do a little bit of this tonight, just digging into LangChain. I'm looking for the building blocks right now for the idea. And I've already got a bit basic idea. I'll have to start by coding the definitions at first, the pipeline definitions, for example. But I would like to find or create a generic um, schema that lets you to find these pipelines in JSON or something like that, where you like specify the model and the purpose of each node and then the system prompt and then the user prompt, for example, in a structured format that could be passed into a user interface where people could define these chains graphically and not have to do so much coding. But that's the general aim. And then to have a, like a portfolio of these types of things, identify common business processes, identify common personal uh, research needs or whatever and to start sketching out some of these workflows and maybe sharing them or something there could already be something that's doing this exact idea I haven't seen it I've been looking for it something similar so that's just an idea I was like working on last night meanwhile protecting the Western friend website from bots so let's switch over to this task now yeah, and I guess it would be written in Python with a Langchain or something equivalent. I haven't done too much more research, but Langchain seems like the sort of de facto solution for chaining together these models. And then there's, uh, what was the other thing? For deployment, there's some solutions for deploying the chains and managing that. Uh, what was it I found? ML flow. I've been keeping an eye on that for a while. And I'd probably use a Django backend just because I'm familiar with Django and it has access control and things like that. And I don't want to be investing too much in building our own models or running our own models at this point. I would probably just use APIs like the um, OpenAI API, for example. So let me consolidate real quick. We'll use Chappy GPT and I'll need that for docs. Context switch. So here's my task. Protection for the registration form. Yeah, yeah, no, no commitment necessary. It's just it's open source, so you're everyone's feel can feel free to contribute and steer the project. I don't even know what the name would be or anything like that. So, it's just an idea at this point. I'd like to see it come to fruition because I think it would be very useful for a lot of even just personal reasons, like writing blog posts or something, where I've kind of started to craft a process around how I engage the LLM to write the blog post, although. Sometimes you can get a good output with one prompt, but generally not, especially for longer or articles, longer posts or articles. And if you want to write a book, like a textbook or even just a report, it's going to be more involved. There's going to be more steps involved. So if you have just this book writing assistant that guides you through the steps, that would be rad and helps you get your best work out by prompting you to get what's in your mind into good form and adds you know all these other insights that are latent in both your knowledge and the, the machine learning model. It's just activating all this latent space both in the human and the, um, the LLM, generative AI.
All right, we need a branch, and this would be registration form captcha. And we have this captcha installed. I've signed up. I've got our keys configured already. We, mm, I don't think we need this proxy right now or that. So I think we just we're gonna find our form and add a, a captcha field. So where was that? Accounts form from captcha fields. Now it's not a typical Django form though. It's a registration form, which actually does come from Django forms. So this might just work. And it's just the recapture field and maybe it doesn't need any configuration even. So see what happens. Yeah, a lot of empty pro promises in open source, and it's easy to get really excited about something. And you know, in the m moment, you, you're like, "Yes, I can help with that." But then life comes around, and yeah, it's busy, and uh, you have other priorities. And honestly, sometimes you just want to like build your own thing or focus on your own hobby. So that's cool. I understand the tensions. All right, localhost. So now, if I'm not logged, in, okay, I'll log out. Yeah, and we got to make the time. We have to be real intentional about that. That motivation is doesn't come cheap. Okay, log, now if I go to actually register. Yeah, we have a capture field. Yes, register. Yeah, and then now we get these instructions to activate our account. This was from a different, oops, wrong button, darn it. I was do this from Mac, you can do, just could copy control C, but then Linux, I always forget you have to do control shift C because there's some old control C from Unix days is kill a process or whatever. Anyway, so I get my, Things mixed up. So our account's been activated. R matey. And logging in should work. Wow, that was like a one line of code change due to the previous <laughs> code adding recapture. So in today's session, basically, more cleanup got our old uh, or the code removed that we don't want to maintain in the long run. We want, it was temporary code. I can revert the PR, restore the code if we need it, but clean that up and then added one line of code to enable capture protection on our registration form. Wow, two lines of code, three lines of code. That's true. Money does give us some freedom and optionality, but time is the truly scarcest resource. And I've wasted so much time in my life, so I'm trying to make up for it. It's like, you know, Bygones are bygones. Okay, so we'll create that. Closes 817. And at this point, our forms are protected. So this actually will close the uh, item. Number 817. Yeah, let's see. What are some sayings about time being scarce or fleeting and wasted on youth? <laughs> time and tide wait for no man. Youth is wasted on the young. <laughs> Life is short. Time is swift. Tempus fugit. Fugit. Time flies. Tempus fugit. Interesting. The days are long, but the years are short. Gather ye rosebuds while ye may. That's pretty. Time is the wisest counselor of all. So maybe youth is wasted on the young. <laughs> that's kind of, <laughs> that's similar to what you were asking. Time is wasted on the youth, <laughs> that's true too. Nice. Yeah, George Bernard Shaw, possibly. Yeah, true, those hallucinations uh, are possible, but I've had a pretty good success rate. Let's see. <laughs> If I do one, new chat, GPT-4, browse with Bing. Oops, wrong button. But I do GPT-4, browse with Bing. And even have GPT-4 fact check itself. But that's a really crucial observation you're making too, especially if you know I'm gonna go into this area and idea of using these large language model chains, agents to build business processes that every step of the way there's some uncertainty and it's probably, yeah, or hallucination or those types of things, error. And it probably accumulates, right? It's something like that, where each step inherits the error from the previous steps and can kind of spiral. So quality control is an interesting dilemma. And this, these things are almost non-deterministic. So it's kind of also a bit <laughs> making me question if the idea is even possible or feasible. That's what uh, I want to start experimenting with it. Yeah, true. The, so less is more, you know, you know, using those type of heuristics, keep it simple, less is more. And the transparency you know, or opacity of the models is a bit concerning as well, because we can't really, you know, always de determine how it 
came to the conclusion or where it got the information from. But you know, there are techniques like here where we can get um, citations. So we can have the model inspect itself, and I've also um, have been watching some. Um, this guy does these knowledge graphs, and he's showing this interesting way. If I have, let's see if I can have it here. YouTube, LM knowledge graph. Mm, that was one. That was an interesting one, but that's not the one. Let me see if I can find this. He has this product. It's really good. Interesting here. I think it's. Not sure if I'll be able to find this. That's Neo4j. Uh, here he is. Uh, rag knowledge graphs. Gosh darn it. I I can't find it. But it's looking at how to make the output of these LLMs more. Uh, here, here's a guy. Notice Labs. This is this guy's pretty crazy. Uh, he's got this product that lets you take the output of LLMs and uh, sort of build knowledge graphs out of it. And uh, then you can inspect the knowledge graph for like latent semantics in areas of the semantic space that you might not have explored or might be uh, making false connections. And he's one of his ideas is that um, it improves the quality of the output and makes the model more transparent through multiple iterations. And this tool you use like if you're writing a blog post or doing research or summarizing an article to see the main knowledge space. So this, I don't know. These are very interesting topics. But yeah, I got what you're saying about keeping it simple and transparent. And what other heuristics would be good? Well, being inclusive, so basically including more people uh, by being open source. So in a way, ChatGPT was correct that it's often attributed to George Bernard Shaw. Ah. Okay, so yeah, it was a paraphrase. Um, paraphrase of a uh, um, hearsay <laughs> but that's the nature of knowledge and, and knowledge that's just embedded in these large language models as well the simplest fact yeah manual fact checking or reading the user manual rtfm <laughs> although that is i was just having some troubles yesterday with some documentation and came to the realization that they should be following the diataxis framework uh, because the most of the knowledge in that manual was explanation and reference and more so reference it was like almost completely reference and what i was needing in that situation where i was dealing with uh, a registration flow uh, for a django package what well, i was just needing a how-to guide it's very practical steps I, I honestly didn't i we worked through it out got the thing done but um, a simple tutorial how-to would have just like push, pushed me forward no fact checking needed there the code in this case is the fact if it runs it is the fact checker i guess but yeah this is an interesting framework and writing documentation is hard and it's even hard to know what to write and oftentimes we just like lean into reference because it's like well the the class has these members and this one does that and that one does that and maybe we'll add a little bit of why <laughs> why it does that uh, but in my daily practice at work we we don't have like almost any of this we have almost none of that and there's a lot of pushback even to add comments in the code offering explanation although we're getting better about that and linking things to jira tickets and stuff and be like why does this function exist and yeah why are we checking out here but and we don't have much of this either actually our documentation is kind of poor at work but for public projects we should be seeking balance somewhere be here balanced between these but i think starting here at the practical steps and then working to the theoretical knowledge uh, if you've got limited time and even just starting with a tutorial and then extending or you know you could choose your own adventure there yeah that's true like the reference docs can come out of the doc strings for example in python or dart does that for very well so yeah then the humans are able to do this and for example gpt uh, or copilot can actually help me write my docs so what it was here Copilot, see if we can get some help. Custom user registration form with a CAPTCHA. <laughs> you know, it's pretty obvious, but if I'm just inheriting this form in some place, I might not be looking at all its members. So there we go. Small improvement. Interesting. And then Lint. And my Linter helps me out too. I will take it. Yeah, and, tu and tutorials are pretty tricky to make, aren't they? And especially when libraries change and uh, the way you do things is always shifting around a bit i can see you know why it's so uh, uncommon to write 
quality documents. It takes an investment, in an intentional process. Okay, so we've pushed, uh, we're gonna push that change, and I'm gonna merge this. And it's been one hour, I'll take a break, gather my thoughts, and probably come back in about one more hour and work on this LangChain idea, just to see what's out there, how it works, watch some tutorials maybe, and take some first steps with LangChain. This is a bit slow, isn't it? The CI pipeline. Oops, refresh the page real quick. Yeah, when we started this project, it was Django 2. Funnily enough, when we launched when we, on Wednesday, it just didn't feel like anything. <laughs> it was weird. I was thinking it would be like a celebratory moment. We're like, yeah, we did it. Uh, but anyway, it was like a, well, it was just more of like a, it's launched now. I don't even know how it really felt. But I'm kind of tired, a little bit tired. And of course, it's not done. There's still stuff, work to do, but um, nonetheless, we got the MVP out. Minimum usable, probably. Minimum usable. All right. So I think I'm just going to merge this uh, so it can start the deployment step. I could probably run these tests faster here. Uh, here, I don't have a test covering the templates, so I don't check for the presence of a new field. But okay, we'll merge this. This is an intermediate, intermit, uh, what is it? Intermittent failure. This integrity error. Something about my user factory, my paginator test. I'm somehow generating duplicate emails, but that's just an intermediate error, intermittent issue, a flaky test, basically. So I will merge that, and when it runs on main, it'll be fixed. I'll have to fix that flaky test later. Brazen disregard of a failing test. But hopefully this will turn to a green checkbox. Well, I'll do a quick outro. So this has been another live code hangout, working on the Western Friend website on a small pull request to add CAPTCHA to our user registration form. That pull request has now been merged. There's only a few lines of code, and did a larger um, code removal of around 5,500 lines by removing the content migration app and all its accompanying tests was that our maintainability stayed about the same, but our code coverage increased due to having overall high code coverage in most of the other areas of the um, project, except we had 46% code coverage in the content migration app. It was fairly complicated code, um, not intended for long-term maintenance. And we did a lot of manual testing on that and multiple migrations, so full content migrations using those tools, um, which gave us enough confidence that the code was behaving correctly, such as by auditing the uh, resulting content in Wagtail. If you'd like to get involved with this project, um, and. Uh, Manual regression testing is an interesting uh, idea as well. I should have, and do you keep like a script of uh, common tests so that you remember <laughs> the steps to take? That's a good uh, idea for quality assurance. I, maybe I could, I could um, introduce that here in our documentation. So if you're watching this video summary and you'd like to get involved with this project, you can stop by github.com slash Western Friend. And we're in the WF website project. We do appreciate contributions of all kinds, uh, not just code, and we try to uh, acknowledge different kinds of, but as well as code contributions, because those are usually the most obvious. But we appreciate bug reports, improvements to our documentation, such as uh, contributing a manual regression uh, test document, and uh, project management, design work, security improvements, all of that. We try to we try to mention who's helped us uh, bring this project along in these last five years so thanks for checking out the live stream dota thanks for stopping by and hanging out it's always nice to uh, have somebody to chat with uh, while doing these work all right well have a great day and hopefully see you around a little bit later